In the name of God, creator, redeemer, sustainer. Amen. Amen. Is this not the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, to bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover them, and not to hide yourself from your own kin. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. Before I begin, I encourage you to take your bulletin home, because I think all that need be said today or tonight can be found in this Isaiah reading. He tells us what we need to do and in a positive way. It's not with hiding and um, fasting. It's a different kind of fast. It's like fasting from your usual self and going out and be a better self. So I encourage you to take it home and read it. As we know, Lent is a season of preparation and fasting. The Council of Nicaea in 325 is who formalized this practice of Lent. And when it began in Rome, it was for the penitents and notorious sinners. And that's the prayer book you'll find out in a few minutes, actually uses that word notorious as well. But it was for them to begin their period of public penance on the first day of Lent in preparation for their restoration with the sacrament of the Eucharist. They were sprinkled with ashes, dressed in sackcloth, and obliged to remain apart until they were reconciled with the Christian community on Monday, Thursday. Those practices held up until about the 8th or 9th century. And then, for some reason, they decided all of us were sinners, maybe not notorious, but they realized the truth that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and that everyone needed to be marked with the ashes. Um, I always wonder what really made them change their mind. Was it really ones who, it could be that they just were tired of people being called out as a scapegoat, kind of like in school these days, you know, nobody's really bad. They just did something that they shouldn't have. Um, or did they finally really understand what the scripture said about sin? Because no one more or less than anyone else is a sinner. All have sinned. Now, when I try to engage the young people about sin, and I'm talking, you know, some like Abby's age over here and Briley and some of the little ones, um, I find I have to get very basic with them because the notion of sin is something they don't really have. If I ask a room full of kids if they sinned this morning, most of them won't raise their hand at all. Well, you know, they haven't murdered anybody, they haven't stolen anything, they probably haven't cheated, um, so they don't think they've sinned. And I might even ask adults the same thing, because I don't think any of us grasp exactly what sin is. The kids just hear and mimic what they see us do, and if we haven't done an adequate job of understanding sin, then it's easy for us not to pass it on to the kids. Because sin is not the particulars of what we do. It is those things we do that separate us from God. So there's a difference. It's easy to accuse, to see an overt sin. But what is it that makes us not feel close to God? Now, when the kids tell me they haven't sinned, I'll ask them, well, did you maybe yell at your mother or father this morning? 
you know, did you maybe punch your little brother or sister or cousin to tell him to get out of the way? Or maybe you just told a little white lie like, yeah, I brushed my teeth, I promise I did. And then I go on to ask them though, if you did those same things with Jesus standing in the room, would you think they were right to do? Would your opinion of your actions change if you really thought of it as God in the room with you? And of course, nobody wants God or Jesus to know any of the bad stuff that we do, but guess what? We have an all-knowing, omniscient God. And so when we want to hide who we are and what we do from God, then we are separated from realizing his love for us, and thereby we have the sinful note. Sin is whatever separates us from the love of God, and it's not separating us from God loving us. It's separating us from being able to feel that love of God. And I have a feeling that in the, in the gospel, the, the pious people that Jesus was talking about when saying, you know, don't go out praying out loud, don't give your alms out where everybody notices, those people are probably doing those things out loud to try and cover for the unworthiness they feel on the inside because they've done something to separate them from the love of God. Today, as we participate in Ash Wednesday liturgy, let us reflect on our own various separations from the love of God, and let us find ways to become reconciled with any and all things that stand in the way of knowing and receiving the true love of God. Let us throw off the bad that we do and embrace a Lent full of fasts as such that Isaiah put before us. Let us loose the bonds of injustice, undo the thongs of the yoke. Let the oppressed go free and break every yoke. Let us share bread with the hungry and house the homeless. Let us prepare to answer, here I am when God calls. Amen. Amen.